Hello, and welcome to Materials Unlocked, the podcast where we take a look at the less known subject of material science and try to unlock its mysteries. My name is Dr. Lewis Owen, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Sheffield. In each episode, with the help of some students, friends, and colleagues, we're going to delve into a particular topic and hopefully unlock its potential. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about defining the problem and thinking about how we go about translating a problem that we might have into an industry into a challenge that we can tackle from a materials point of view. And as always, uh, on this journey, I am joined by one of our current students in the department. And this week, it's my great pleasure to introduce Francis Levera. Francis, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Francis, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? You're currently in your fourth year as a PhD yeah, student. Yeah, so right? I'm in my final six months of my PhD. Oh gosh, where it really gets yeah. serious at this point, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my PhD focuses on brazing of additively manufactured materials. Essentially, it boils down to the joining, which is brazing, using a metal that melts and then re-solidifies of AM components, so additively manufactured. And these are metals that you process using a laser to rapidly melt and re-solidify them. And we're basically seeing how those components differ from stuff that's been traditionally manufactured. So you're interested in actually, if you create these these new joints, whether that improves the property of the final component. So yeah. you're not necessarily designing the new materials, you're looking at the materials response sort of further down the line, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So I'm very much looking at the fundamentals of how something that's been manufactured in a different way mm. impacts the future joining steps. Mm. And with all the benefits of additive manufacturing, how does that actually influence the next step of the entire material journey. Mm. Yeah, so for those who um, additive manufacturing, some people might not have come across before, but it's it's uh, a type of, some people might know it more commonly as 3D printing um, and have seen it with plastics. And in fact, we'll have a whole episode later uh, in the podcast series about this very topic. But today we're, we're talking about, um, as I say, defining the problem and thinking about how we translate that. Francis, you're, if I remember correctly, on a CDT, is that right? So you're part of our Centre of Doctoral Training here at the university. And through this, the this, this centre of doctoral training, often people work quite closely with industry. Do you have industrial collaborators on your project? Yes, I do. Actually, I'm sponsored by the UK AEA. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> handily. We've got someone in the room who's an expert in that field. So yeah, I work very closely with the special techniques groups at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And they primarily look at joining work as well. So it fits really well with my PhD research. Yeah, well, this brings us very nicely onto our specialists for today. So uh, we're joined by uh, two people, uh, one in the room and one remotely. Uh, as Francis has said, uh, we are joined today by someone from the UK Atomic Energy Authority, Dr. Dave Bowden, who is a group leader in material science at UKAA. So Dave, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Lewis. Good to be here. So, Dave, uh, could you just tell us a bit about your your background to begin with? How did you end up at UKAA? What, where, where did you come from? Were you a material scientist to begin with, or have you taken a, a different route to get here? Yes, I, I always sort of say I've taken a fairly meandering route through engineering. Um, so I actually started off with studying aerospace engineering many years ago, and since uh, I, I moved then into um, BAE Systems, where I actually worked um, in the maritime division. So sort of, you know, heavy engineering, big shipyard, lots of, you know, really impressive construction going on. And yeah, really, it was through that that I started to get very interested in nuclear propulsion and, and uh, everything that I was seeing being installed in, in some of the submarines that I was um, I was helping to build. I actually then uh, looked into some of the processing, uh, materials processing that was going into some of the components in those in those uh, reactor modules. I applied for a PhD at the University of Manchester, where I um, I looked at some interesting wear-resistant steels for uh, PWR applications. And that kind of led quite nicely into me uh, pursuing more in the in the field of nuclear materials and, and applied for the role at, at UKA, where I've been for the last, well, nearly five years now. 
been uh, a very interesting journey. I joined at just the right time, it seems, in terms of the kickoff of the um, Spherical Tokamak Energy um, production program. So um, that's uh, the STEP program, which is otherwise known as. Spent the first few years very closely involved in that, um, you know, needing a lot of the efforts around uh, material selection and definition. So very interested by the topic you mentioned today, because I've, I've been sort of at the coalface um, with these sorts of uh, interesting challenges and, and definition requirements. And that's that's kind of led to me where I am now, spearheading development of new materials, primarily structural steels uh, for fusion power plant applications in the future. That's fantastic. Yeah, we'll we'll pick up on a, a number of those things today uh, as we talk about it. I think in uh, in our very first episode, we talked about material science as a sort of very broad subject and how people get into material science. And I think it's not uncommon for people to come through various different routes. I came from sort of the other side of things coming from chemistry and possibly coming from the more fundamental theoretical side, whereas it sounds like you've come much more from the applied side and always been interested in that sort of application and much more the engineering focus um, of material science and engineering. Because in fact, here in Sheffield, we are the Department of Material Science and Engineering. So we have that joint science and engineering focus. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done any sort of aspect in isolation. It's always been, yeah, the science has always been towards an applied goal, um, which is, yeah, obviously really nice when you're working on those subject areas to know that there is a application for the work that you're doing, um, ultimately to deliver something in an engineering context. So that's been really rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. And I, we always need to have that concept in the back of our minds as to how it affects the choices that we make when designing materials. So that's something we'll pick up in more detail. But just before we do, I'm going to introduce our other specialist in the room, Professor Ian Todd, who is a professor here at the University in Sheffield, a professor of metallurgy and materials processing, and is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Ian, Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me along, Lewis. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. So, Ian, a, a similar question to you to, to, to Dave. Could you tell us just a bit about your background, your research, what you do, and possibly how you work with or give <clears> us a flavour <throat> of some of the, the work you've done in the past, particularly with that sort of industrial mindset? Yeah. So, I am a metallurgist. I started off doing metallurgy, and I actually did my degree here a very, very long time ago now. And since then, I mean, the thing that's always interested me about it is... How do I make a material into a really complicated shape and how do I guarantee that it's going to perform as I want it to? And that's the sort of question that's always driven me uh, throughout my career. Uh, can I make this not just in the right shape, but with the right performance straight away? Mm -hmm. So this idea of performance on demand. And that's where I got into additive manufacturing in that way or 3D printing, as you mentioned, it's often called. 3D printing allows you to take that very complex shape which is really good fun to play with by the way you get some great ornaments to put in your office and uh, it's turn a beautiful to, little lizards absolutely I mean, and, and we've got more lizards than you can shake and stick out. <laughs> uh, we used to make genuinely used to make a lot of uh, minions at one point uh. to give away <laughs> uh, but you know beyond that we're also able to make very complicated components that sit in rockets or sit inside of you know things like fusion reactors and it's very easy to do that in some respects you know it can always make the form but the question has always been, would you want to use it? Mm -hmm. And so that's where we've got into working across understanding what the process does, understanding what the what's going on when we're making it, understanding what the properties are likely to be when we've made them. And like I say, that's that's the kind of thing that's driven me throughout my career in a really nice way, actually. So I mean, I've worked with lots and lots of great students, of course, you mean like people like Francis here, of course, and we, over that time. And uh, it's been interesting to see it go from being a real just a curiosity. You know, we were the, the freak show at the end of the uh, the tours. Uh, behold, they are making parts from thin air <laughs> uh, to it being the point where everybody really understands what 3D printing is. So that's been an interesting journey. Yeah, because uh, 3D printing as a sort of field has really taken off in the, the last few <clears> years. And, you know, uh, lots of people have these little modules at home and things. But I think one of the, the interesting things you're talking about with this uh, shaping of components as I say, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what material science is, and I don't think people necessarily appreciate that we're designing things at all length scales, right from, you know, thinking about what's going on the atomic level to the microscopic level, but also on that sort of macroscopic level of the shape of a component that you can hold in your hand. And the materials properties contribute to that 
that challenge at, at, at every length scale. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, you can look at it from both directions. So I think material scientists tend to start off with, you know, what happens in, in between atoms and then work upwards. To yeah, that's where I tend to sit. Absolutely. Thinking about I mean, I understand. <laughs> I was just kind of what I uh, But as I start, I start at the other end of it, which is like, this is the scale of something that I want to build. And it can be, you know, on the scale of a jet engine component, or it could be on the scale of sort of a, a minion or whatever you want to make. And then it's what does the, what is, what has to be in the right order in order to give you the mechanical performance or the, 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 the functional performance, which is sort of magnetic or thermoelectric or something like that, that you actually need. How do I do that? And those two things don't necessarily connect mm. terribly well. The yes. bit in the middle, the messy bit, <laughs> where you turn this beautiful thing that you made in the lab on you know, tens of nanometers into something that's a meter and a half in size. And that, that's really the fascinating thing about material science. It, it spans that length scale. Mm. Let's pick up on some of these uh, industrial sort of things and uh, choices that we've we've already sort of referred to. And actually, where I want to start, um, I'm going to move move back to Dave to begin with, because the UK Atomic Energy Authority is looking at how we might get nuclear fusion to work. And nuclear fusion is one of those things. I mean, we're sort of moving away from from materials now and a bit more into physics. But uh, nuclear fusion is one of those things that you often hear talked about in the news. People are very interested about it and the potential that, that it offers. Dave, I wondered if you could kick us off by just helping us to understand just what nuclear fusion is, like how it works and why it might be important for us and our, our energy sector going forward. Absolutely. Nuclear fusion is obviously a process which is happening all around us and certainly providing um, one of our primary energy sources on Earth, which is our, our sun. And, and we're basically trying to replicate what what we can what we see from our our local star here on Earth, but obviously bearing in mind some of the limitations that we have compared to what the sun is doing. So the sun is using immense gravity to basically um, fuse hydrogen isotopes together to produce um, um, immense amounts of energy as a result. And we don't have you know the capability to use uh, massive gravitational um, fields in that way on on Earth. But what we're we're using instead are magnetic fields to confine superheated plasma and we will superheat two specific isotopes of hydrogen deuterium and tritium and these are then confined within the in the magnetic field and we at uka we're pursuing a torus configuration so there are different types of fusion such as inertial confinement and, and we've obviously heard quite a bit about that in recent years um, particularly with results from the us where they've actually achieved what we call break even in the in the fusion space whereby they produced more energy out then they've had to use um, to actually start the reaction. But as I say, we're focused on magnetic confinement fusion, and, and that's developing this torus of donut-shaped plasma. And within that, we have our deuterium and, and tritium, and we heat that plasma up to somewhere around 150 million degrees C. And that enables uh, the, the isotopes to overcome the electrostatic repulsion that they otherwise would have. So we're basically we're ionizing and stripping the um, electrons away to allow those, uh, those isotopes to fuse. And then from there, when that fusion occurs, we produce a neutron and helium. It's really the neutrons that we're very interested in um, from an energy perspective because those pass into our surrounding materials and interact with those materials and actually enable us to capture um, the energy that they, they possess. So it's actually a transfer, transfer of the kinetic energy of the neutron into thermal energy as it's implanted into the surrounding structure. And that we can capture and extract and use that to drive ancillary systems, which would put energy on the grid. So things like turbines, for instance, um, which would be driven by the heated coolant that we will circulate through that, that plant. I should mention the helium does have a, another important function because that also imparts thermal energy into our plasma, which actually keeps the plasma nice and hot. Um, so actually, once you get to that point, you've got what we call a plasma a burn, basically. So the, the reaction is self-sustaining. And that's that's always been you know, something that we've been pursuing in the field with magnetic climate fusion is getting to this point where we can have a stable, consistent plasma, um, which which gives us a very steady stream of energy that we can then capture and and use um, to put onto the grid. So in a nut nutshell, that's uh, that's fusion and, and sort of how it works and, and the, the reaction at play. It's um, when we're talking about the fuels and, and uh, you know, this sort of equivalency, it's a very clean energy source. So actually deuterium one of the isotopes that i mentioned is readily available in water so there's a huge abundance for many um, thousands of years um, if we had a whole 
fleet of fusion reactors running globally, we wouldn't be anywhere near to worrying about exhausting that supply for uh, many millennia. Tritium, on the other hand, is a little bit more tricky. Um, so mm. tritium uh, isn't naturally occurring. There's a tiny amount um, formed in the upper atmosphere as a result of interaction with cosmic rays, but it's a very tiny amount that's not um, economically viable to capture. Um, so most of our tritium that we rely on these days actually comes from fission plants, primarily um, the Kandu reactors in Canada which use, uh, have an element of uh, heavy water in their systems, which actually then enable tritium to be, to be bred in those, in those systems. Um, but again, it's a very small quantity. And when we're talking about fleets of commercial fusion reactors in the future, then actually the demands on the tritium supply are going to be quite large. So that's why mm-hmm. we're very key on developing what we call the breeder blanket systems. And that's an area where our materials research and my team are are focused, as I say, on the structural material side. But it's these breeder blankets that are the central, the linchpin really for all of of the uh, useful outcomes of of fusion power, really, because the blanket will contain all of the coolant systems. So that will be driving the extraction of all the thermal energy to be put onto onto the grid as electrical energy. And it also will contain lithium bearing compounds. And that's where it's really important that those lithium bearing compounds interact with the neutrons being generated as part of the fusion reaction. And that that actually triggers a secondary reaction whereby the lithium um, transforms into tritium and some more helium. And we'd separate the two, we'd feed the tritium back into the plant to be used as fuel and the helium will be taken away potentially could be sold as a secondary product because helium is actually quite quite a scarce um, commodity itself. So really, we've got this nice sort of life cycle whereby the plant actually becomes self-sustaining by breeding its own fuel, which then is fed back into that fuel cycle. So hopefully that didn't, didn't go too far into the weeds there, but that sort of paints the picture as the sort of fuel cycle and the reaction cycle in a, in a fusion reactor. Yeah, no, no, that's great. There are, there are a few things I think it would be just worth picking up on there because I think one of the things with fusion is that a lot of people have heard of nuclear fusion uh, for, for quite a while and people don't necessarily have an appreciation of the challenges and roadblocks that are being faced in its successful implementation. And just to pick up on, on some of the things that you mentioned, you mentioned the method with which we uh, contain it. Obviously, as you say, in the sun, it's done by gravitational, but then other people are coming up with different ways. You mentioned magnetic confinement. You also mentioned inertial confinement. Could you just explain what, what inertial confinement is? Effectively, inertial confinement is the US approach has been using lasers. So it's basically you've got mm-hmm. a fuel pellet, um, which contains your um, isotopes, again, your deuterium and your tritium. And in this case, they're using lasers, many lasers, uh, and these are all pointed effectively at that fuel pellet, which then when they're all fired at once causes superheating of that pellet and ultimately the pellet collapses onto itself and that allows the fusion event to occur and that and then the energy is released and captured as a result so um, that that is another method of achieving that there are lots of different different ways of doing it yeah yeah um, yeah there's some where you can just fire projectiles effectively so you can fire the fuel at other fuel pellets just crash things together very quickly <laughs> exactly exactly so yeah there's many different flavors of fusion but yeah magnetic confinement is the one that we're we're pursuing and then as you say there's with, with any process there's a question about fuel and how we get fuel and this sounds you know quite miraculous that essentially you can create the idea is to create something that creates its own fuel that you can feed back into the system. It's a, you know, it's, it's a wonderful idea. It's fantastic. And then also, I mean, the, the, the big thing then you're talking about with breeder blankets and where we start to think about more the materials challenge is, I suppose, just on a very simplistic and basic level, essentially what you're trying to do is create a, a miniature sun that has to be contained within something. You've got to have some stuff uh, to put around it. In a previous episode, when we were um, talking about the materials design cycle in general, we were saying that we've been very lucky in a way that for many hundreds, thousands of years, we've always had just stuff lying around that we could make things from. You know, we had stones or metal that we extracted from ores and things. But with these real sort of high end engineering challenges, we're now having to create bespoke materials to really tackle these harsh environments that are being created by this engineering challenge. Absolutely. So 
Yes. So we're we're looking at structural materials, but we are we are recognizing obviously that there are conventional structural materials which are versatile. Um, so in in our case, we're looking at steels. Conventional steels have some quite severe limitations for us in a fusion reactor. So for instance, radioactivity is one of them. So an interesting point with um, fusion reactors is that actually because the neutron energies are so much higher than you get with a fission plant, that actually we need to be concerned with how active structural materials become. There's no spent fuel with a fusion reactor, so you don't have to worry about um, radioactive fuel and, and storing that for tens of thousands of years afterwards, as you do with a fission plant. But we do have um, structural materials which can become irradiated um, during that operation or do become irradiated and then as a result can become radioactive. So when people talk about um, traditional nuclear power plants and fission uh, nuclear power, often people think about, you know, decommissioning and people are aware that there's a sort of a lifetime to the, the power plants. With with this then, this higher energy then, is it anticipated that some of the parts might be needed to re- be replaced sort of more frequently uh, during during the process. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, some of the materials that we, we have to consider might be swapped out on a regular maintenance schedule. So, you know, we sort of talk with blankets, breeder blankets, you know, and this is from the European community as well, as a broader piece, talking about sort of maintenance schedules between every four to five years of a complete swap. And that's just because the the materials get damaged and degrade um, during their operation um, and need to be taken away and reprocessed and then new materials put in their place. So, um, you know, the sorts of damages we're talking about with neutron interaction go into the realms of hundreds of displacements per atom of damage, uh, which effectively each displacement per atom is every time we move a atom out of its original lattice position. It's just sort of like snooker balls hitting or something. It's sort of like snooker balls. Snooker balls, exactly. You know, one displacement would be you know moving one snooker ball from its original position once. If we're talking about hundreds, then actually it's moving that same snooker ball a hundred times. And in fact, you're doing that to every snooker ball on the table. So if you'd arrange them in a very specific way, by the end of the rearrangement, things are going to look pretty messy um, compared to that starting point. And we've got exactly the same situation with atoms in our lattice. So... We, we then have to account for those effects. And, and they, those have huge implications because materials that look great from a starting point, you know, if we take them as received and test them, you get lovely material properties, um, you know, excellent strength, excellent toughness, all the sorts of things we're looking for. Actually, what happens when we start to neutral irradiate those is they change dramatically. And in fact, in some cases, it's not even like you're looking at the same material anymore. So um, normally we see effects such as hardening with irradiation. So the materials become very brittle. They no longer have um, the same sort of elongation you you um, had in the original as received state. So they lose a lot of their plasticity. So you don't really have any ability for the material to deform before failure, uh, which is a huge concern for us. And then you, then you look at things like fracture toughness and that, that tends to drop very dramatically as well as a result so you end up with a very embrittled quite a sort of you know concern from an engineering standpoint that that these properties change so dramatically um, from the starting point and that's something we we do uh, what we're really grappling with um, in in the fusion community because we don't have a test reactor all the time to get us to those sorts of levels of damage that a commercial reactor would experience so we currently Mm -hmm. don't have a device Mm -hmm. physically to give us 14 MeV neutrons and the hundreds of displacements per atom of damage. So we have to do a lot of this through extrapolation. And this involves modeling and understanding how those materials change throughout life and starting to extrapolate those properties out um, to much longer timescales than we're able to experimentally access at the moment. Yes, it's often one of the challenges in, in, in a whole host of industries, I think, that we can't necessarily always test things in the exact conditions we want and we need to create fair tests and models and use the data that we have in order to sort of extrapolate out um, you know, onto that longer time scale. I, I wanted to just go back to something you were talking about um, earlier. You were saying that you could potentially pick up on existing materials and adapt those and thinking uh, you mentioned steels, which are you know one of the most sort of common materials that, that people find in the world around. And I think it's often the case that when we look at these challenges, we often start with existing materials and seek to sort of adapt them, as well as sort of in parallel looking at making brand new materials. So I don't know if I turn some of the other people in the room and and Ian, with the the processes that that you've been looking at, is is it a mixture of the two or do you find that it's it's predominantly one or the other? 
I mean, the reality is that once somebody invents or creates a material and it gets through all of the tests that are required in order to get it into service. So if you you know if you think about the things we make aeroplane engines out of or we make cars out of or we do that kind of thing. So a lot of testing goes on between, oh, look, I have this super new material and yes, you're able to use that in implants or jet engines or air- airframes or anything. So there tends to be a sort of a, if you come up with a new process, a new way of making something, the, the pressure is on you mm. to make sure that you don't have to go away and invent a new one. But unfortunately, <laughs> processes and materials don't behave like that. Mm. And we often find ourselves having to make these sort of fairly clever minor tweaks to either the chemistry that we've got in, the, 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 how what elements there are inside of the material, or um, basically just fundamentally go back to the basics of how the material is is behaving when you do all of these horrible things like shoot lasers at it and remelt it or hit it with a hammer or whatever. You know, we've got to go back and understand what its reaction is mm. and then try and work out how we use that hammer more gently mm. or how we use that laser more cleverly in order to hit the properties that people still want to get. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a uh, two sides, really. I mean, you can take the roots of every problem requires a new material. And that turns into a very expensive and long t- long term program work up to 30 years in fact yeah. plus <laughs> uh, if you're not very careful um uh, or you look at it and you say within a series of constraints which is a very engineering approach you know you say i'm only allowed to vary my composition a little bit or i'm only allowed to uh, do this sort of very minor thing to my material um can i actually find a way of creating a object from it that is suitable for the new application that we're that we're considering To be fair, when you're working with industry, they would much prefer you to do the latter than the former. Mm. Uh, But sometimes, unfortunately, we have to embark on these explorations again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And and Francis, the materials that you're working with, are they existing materials? Are they new materials or a combination of the two? So I've actually designed my PhD around existing materials. When I begun my research, I wanted something that I knew that I could print successfully and repeatably. And so I primarily work with a type of stainless steel, which is 316L. And this is a steel which is very widely used across various industries. And the braze alloys, which I use for that joining process, are also all commercially available. The ones that are looking towards more nuclear applications are ones that are less likely to irradiate in a negative way, Mm. as we've heard. So there's some considerations that I've used there, but primarily I have used materials which are readily available because Mm. they are understood. Yes. Rather than having an entire PhD of finding a new material and then going back to the original research question that I had. Mm. And I think that's really interesting what you're saying with the sort of defining the research question and brings us sort of to to this topic that we're talking about in general, because we have materials that might have been designed for a specific purpose. As you see, you've got this stainless steel, which has been designed with something particular in mind. And now we're thinking about how we might apply it to a new situation, a different situation with a different set of challenges um, associated with it. And we can either adapt that material or, as I say, design a, a completely new material. So in terms then, let's have a think uh, in terms of the, the sort of challenges that we, we're, we're facing. So Dave, if I come back to you then, let's have a think about the uh, particular challenges that we might face um, in a nuclear fusion reactor and the sort of materials challenges that we might want to focus and how we go about translating those sort of big engineering problems that, that we've been talking about into something with a materials focus. So if I'm trying to design one of these materials that you've talked about for a a fusion reactor, I I don't know if uh, we're talking about the breeder blankets or another part, what are the design criteria that we're trying to sort of focus on and narrow our our mind down to? As I say, some of the biggest challenges we have are obviously around radiation damage. That's a big one for us in the breeder blanket zone. As I say, we could be looking at hundreds of displacements per atom, and that's going to have a huge effect on material properties. You couple that with mechanical loads, if we're talking through life, you know, we'd be talking four or five years of operation, applied loads, you you know, we sort of typically talk about applied loads in the blanket region of 100 megapascals or so. And then you start to look at things like the creep life of conventional materials such as steel, 
that we've mentioned, and, and particularly we look at um, uh, reduced activation for non-zytic steel. So uh, I mentioned we have this issue with radioactivity. So we have to use steels where we take out elements, which otherwise we would love to use in steel because they give them great properties, but we need to substitute them with lower activation variants. Uh, sorry, you mentioned the radioactivity and the damage. You mentioned the strength of the material. Yeah. And you also mentioned the, the creep life. Could you perhaps just explain what, what creep life is? It's effectively an ongoing process in materials. It's, it's accelerated by temperature. And basically, it's any material that has a, an applied load on it will deform uh, gradually throughout uh, over time. And as I say, as the temperatures rise, that, that deformation will increase. So it's effectively like hanging a weight off of some blue tack is sort of the analogy I use. You know, gradually that blue tack will start to stretch. And the same thing happens in, in materials. That's, that's creep, basically. But that has huge implications in a design space because it obviously modifies your geometry of the component. Eventually, it will start to lead to failure of that part, rupture, um, plastic collapse, because um, the material will become so deformed, so thinned in regions where it's deforming, that actually it can no longer tolerate the stresses in that region and, and will fail. So that's what we refer to as a creep rupture life of a, of a component. And you know, for some of the steels we're looking at, such as uh, fritic manzitic steels, those creep lives are very low uh, at high temperatures. Um, so we, we are often talking about trying to increase um, the operational temperature of the blankets because with a higher operating temperature, you get a much greater thermodynamic efficiency. And, and we often need that sort of margin in the reactors we're talking about with that extra extra bit of temperature. In some cases, we're talking about running 100 degrees hotter than the top end of current conventional steels can handle. So we'd be going from about 550 degrees C up to 650 degrees C. And that can make all the difference in terms of the margins for the operation of the plant, putting out enough net energy for it to be commercially viable. It's also a huge amount of, obviously, extra income um, from anyone who's operating that plant in terms of the revenue generated for the energy produced. So that we've taken that as one of our key challenges, that we have to be able to offer materials to run at these higher temperatures to offer a, a, you know, a favorable economic proposition with, with the whole plant. But then that brings in its, its own new challenges. And as I've alluded to, the creep aspect is one of them. And then creep damage can become exacerbated under irradiation. So we get a swelling effect under irradiation as well. And then this can contribute to a reduction in creep life in the material. So what we're doing is trying to engineer um, conventional steels, taking the phoretic malazitic steels we might, might think about using. So one example of this is called Eurofer 97. It was uh, developed back in the 90s um, in the, by the European crowd. It had several generations before then. It was originally generated from um, grade 91 steel. So that's sort of taken as the base. Grade 91 isn't reduced activation, so they have to swap out the elements and make it clean. Um, and basically, we're looking at modifying this urethra to include nano precipitates in its matrix to actually constrain creep damage. So to capture dislocations, which otherwise would glide through the structure and allow this plastic deformation to occur, we need tiny precipitates in that structure to capture that damage, lock it in, and prevent that creep from becoming excessive. Um, so that's where we've taken, you know, the sort of end point in terms of you, we know we can scale steels up to the level we need. We know how to join them on the most part, although there are some big challenges there still, but we know we can manufacture tons of steel. So what can we do at the beginning of that process to modify mm. it, to give us those those precipitates in that structure to actually address that that problem around the creep lifetime? And that's the sort of route we've taken, is alluding to Ian's earlier comment about sort of um, looking at things from from the end and then going going back from there. It's the, it's the same thing. It's Otherwise, we could go right back to the yeah. drawing board and invent a new material um, to do this. And, and, and there is still work in, in that area. But then you get the issue of how do you upscale that and translate that to, to an industrial scale? So we're definitely looking at the sort of latter end of that process and then trying to reverse engineer it to get to a point where we can, we can develop a microstructure that, that attacks um, those challenges. Yeah, so looking at it at, at, on those on all of those length scales, as you say, and coming from that that applied end, and I think one of the the things to pick up on there is also the fact that often with these materials challenge, you, we've got a whole suite of design requirements that that we've got here. You know, we've got um, uh, as I say, radiation damage. Uh, strength. We've talked about creep life, uh, temperature. You talked about as an important factor uh, in there as well. And often you're performing this sort of huge balancing act between these. And sometimes the very thing that improves one of your properties will make one of your properties much worse. I can see Ian smiling in the room and nodding, and <laughs> I'm not sure his, his, this pain is, is is experienced across a number of different sectors. But it's it's the real sort of 
uh, the, the almost art of material science, sort of balancing these different effects and and how we how, how we do it. But... <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, so when you when you do do these things, I mean, you, you allude that to you know, the, here we go. We've we've uh, we've got Eurofin ninety seven, which kind of tells you how long ago <laughs> we, we we fixed that, and now we're wanting to put something else in it, and um, it's like whack a mole, right? So, uh, or I use the analogy of the uh, the old lady who swallowed a fly. Mm. Uh, what you've got to avoid when you're doing all these processes and all these changes is swallowing the horse at the end, um, and. We can add a small amount of this to, to to modify something else, and but then of course we have to spoil it all by making it into an object, or we mm-hmm. have to spoil it all by joining it together, <laughs> yeah. or we have to spoil it all by putting it into a, into service. One of the wonderful things that's become a real tool for the material scientist and engineer, I guess, over the past um, at least twenty years, as computational speeds have gone up, is of course modeling mm. and. Um, Whilst I'm not a modeler and I'm going to speak entirely from the position of ignorance, <laughs> you know, the work that modelers do in terms of understanding the the processes that go on, like the displacement and, and understanding how you might actually do something to to reduce that a little bit, uh, the understanding of how they, they model creep, how they model the process themselves, allows us to, if you were going to do, do a development program, hopefully speed that up a bit. Mm. So I said it was 30 years, but hopefully, you know, if we use digital technologies and we use these these new approaches, uh, we should be able to reduce that by, you know, a significant amount. I'm not going to say what, but a significant amount. And the nice thing is that, of course, if you understand that you've got a good mathematical or computational mm. model of the material and you understand that it actually predicts things like performance and properties, like uh, how strong it is, how, what its creep rupture life is, you can use that to help you also to design how you make it. Mm. Uh, so understanding all of that becomes very assistive to people like me who go and you know, spoil it all by trying to make a real object. <laughs> but that is incredibly helpful. And and that combination of, as, as you alluded to, Dave, you know, the, the sort of the, you're wanting to understand what the properties are going to be like in 20 years, where you yeah. could sit around and wait 20 years. Or we could use modeling to help us to predict what it's going to be like in 20 years. And if we're happy and content that we've got models that are assisting us, then actually that that modeling aspect is something that's really speeding us up, mm-hmm. both in our understanding and also how we make it. Yeah. And I think that, they, you know, certainly stops you having to go into the lab and make <laughs> thousands of samples. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so in fact, in the next episode, we'll be ta- talking to a couple of modelers uh, about this in a, a in a little more depth and how we can use modeling to predict materials properties, speed up, make, uh, give us an understanding of the different uh, materials that might form and all of those sorts of things. But I think one of one of the the things to sort of draw out also of what what you said there is that it highlights how closely material science as a sort of academic discipline lies to industry and how there's so much back and forth between the two uh, even more so than subjects like chemistry or physics we have to work so closely with people in industry to understand data that's coming out of real life situations yeah. the choices that we're <clears throat> making and as you say that feedback loop between the two um going 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 round and round uh, yeah uh, so there's a thing called technology readiness level that gets used a lot by industry and that, what, what technology readiness level says is have you just had this idea in the shower that okay that's what they call trl one right you've, you've had that idea and then we have this development scheme you know where you go up to a, a number it's a, it's a it's a number it was developed by nasa when they were looking at sort of whether space platforms rockets were ready to go but the higher, what we call higher TRLs, higher technology readiness levels, is when you're actually looking to implement this in, in an industrial environment. And what happens is whilst you might have your design right, you might have the design of your co- everything correct, uh, at that point often your materials start to do things that you don't want them to do or they don't perform as you want. So you can often get the challenge of a what is classically sometimes called a science problem by some of our industrial partners <laughs> uh, popping up inside of a big engineering program. And that's where you've got to go back and understand how you, you know, understand what the process is, so, you know, what the structure that you're creating, what the process is involved in putting your rocket, nuclear reactor, you know, fusion reactor together, what's happened during that, and why is that performance now 
not as it should be. And and you you sort of go in there and kind of try and fix it. it it's it's often requires a lot of thinking and, and a lot of gnashing of teeth, but it, it is usually fixable and it's usually non-obvious how to do it. So it's a case of going back then to the engineering team and saying, okay, avoid doing this bit. Yep. If we handle it in another way, then you will actually avoid that and we'll get it through to service and that won't show up again. But sometimes, unfortunately, the material just won't behave. Mm. <laughs> and that's when that's when a, a sort of a significant rethink uh, can, can turn up. So unfortunately, sometimes material scientists and engineers are seen as gatekeepers and the, the stoppers of wonderful projects. Uh, but it's actually fundamentally, if we don't get it right, the safety of the whole program is at, is at risk. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I believe uh, I'm, I'm right in saying, Dave, that, um, you know, materials is one of the, the roadblocks that has been both identified within the UK and more broadly by people in Europe working on fusion as one of the key things that we need to understand for the successful implementation of fusion. Absolutely. For years, for years, it was the plasma physics. But I think, you know, there's a sort of recognition that we, we're turning a, a, a corner at the moment with that. And, um, you know, there's real confidence that, that what we've demonstrated over the past few years at, at UKA as well, both with JET, the Joint European Taurus, and the uh, mega spherical tokamak um, that we've got on site has really validated, you know, a lot of the plasma physics that's been um, hypothesized and, and put forward over the years. Um, so we're really feeling like we've turned that corner, but yeah, it's it's now looking at, well, actually, how do we build this thing and how do we make sure it survives um, for the life uh, of, of the plant? And and suddenly it's the, the materials are very much, as you say, one of the sort of limiting factors. Um, so there is a very interesting roadmap as well, I should mention, that's um, available online, where it's the Fusion Materials Roadmap. Um, an exercise we carried out with Royce back in um, 2021 that's openly available for, for people to read. But that, that did identify some of those key blockers from the materials perspective. So what, what some of the key challenges are and some of those I've, I've already discussed today, but also what materials could be developed to uh, address some of those challenges and, and what those development uh, pathways look like. So yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there is this recognition that, that you know, if we can't, if you don't get the materials to work, then, you know, we're not going to get the plant to work. It, it's uh, so, sort of that simple, really. Or certainly the plant may not be as um, as reliable as you would want it to be because components would have to be swapped out so regularly. So that's where, yeah, we're sort of having, you know, yeah, we're stepping in uh, as material scientists and, and stepping up our game in, in that sense, of trying to offer some, you know, real solutions to these engineering problems um, uh, to actually make this thing a reality. And that's where, you know, this this exciting collaboration between industry and academia comes in and where people like Francis, you know, get to get to work on these exciting problems. Was it something that like coming to study a PhD was a particular interest or draw to you, that sort of engineering focus and that sort of applied side of the problem? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually like you and I've got a master's degree in chemistry. Oh, well. there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so we've come from the best background. The best background. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that I wanted to look more at the fundamentals of stuff that is actually truly applicable mm. in life. And I felt I wasn't getting that out of my chemistry background. And so I wanted to look at something which had a really clear application. And even going back four years ago, the level of research in AM was completely different focus to what it is now. Mm. And keeping up with that and knowing that I'm playing, even if it is a small role, but a role itself in making nuclear fusion a reality, that's really like the bread and butter for me yeah yeah it's so it, it's so exciting to think that you know this might go into a real component real part <laughs> that could that that could change the the way that we work on these things just picking up on on, on something else um that was mentioned earlier in you talked about these uh trls Obviously, for someone like UKAA, I suppose that you're working across sort of the whole the whole TRL range. You've got a mixture of both sort of the very fundamental stuff going on, and then also you know something that's about to go into to to a real com component. And then, do you work with those things sort of across the range solely in house, or the, there's this collaboration with uh, with academia and sort of people like? Francis or, you know, academics of various institutions. I wondered if you could tell us a bit about that sort of side of things, Dave. 
Yeah. So, yeah, as Ian mentioned, yeah, TRLs resonate strongly. Um, we use them. We use them a lot as a as a metric in house as to where we are um, with our different material development programs. And as you say, Lewis, we're working across the piece. So um, we we sponsor a lot of PhD students, and obviously Francis being being one of those, um, which is is great great to hear. But yeah, so so we're looking at you know some of the lower TRL problems. I would say often you know we're discussing with uh, academia. So not just through PhD projects, but also collaboration where possible. So for instance, I'm I'm running a program at the moment focused on developing new steels and neutron irradiating them to to validate their performance in a, in a fusion um, environment. Uh, we've got uh, 10 different collaborators in that program, including a mix of both academia and industry. And really what we find there is that we've got the very fundamental development aspects um, sort of sitting with academia and, and then obviously the analysis of those materials going through um, academic partners. So using high-end techniques like uh, transmission electron microscopy or atom probe tomography to really probe and investigate these materials um, that, that we're, we're producing. And then um, we've also got industry involved who are very much focusing on the intermediate to higher TRL levels. So thinking actually how do we upscale this material how do we take what we've produced in the lab and actually replicate that at intermediate and larger scales so looking at things again like steels for instance it's uh, you know in the lab we've got very good control on cooling rates and, and volumes of material so we can be really um, really sort of specific um, about how those materials are actually produced and, and what the end result looks like when you start to look at multi-ton ingots of the same type of steel that you suddenly want to produce then your cooling rates actually are immense um you know in some yes. <laughs> some cases we're going from the lab where the cooling rate can be measured in in minutes or perhaps even you know seconds in some cases where you're talking about this with multi-ton ingots being produced you know with a big industrial um, manufacturer then you could be talking about cooling rates lasting days or weeks even so suddenly You've got very different, um, you know, sort of material production um, pipelines. You also then start to worry about things like segregation, you know, and, and how, how you actually replicate those materials in the same way. So we do really, yeah, have to address the entire piece. And, and really, it's trying to do that in some ways all at once, because we don't have that luxury of time to sort of move from one progressively to the next. Because if we do that, then I, again, as Ian's alluded to, you're probably looking at, a, you know, a solid 30 year sort of development timescale to get to that point where you can safely say you're there at TRL eight or nine, ready to put it into, into the component and operate it. So we're really having to sort of fill in the gaps um, in parallel as much as possible um, to really build up this, this picture of how this material performs across the piece. And we can't do that with just industry or just academia. We absolutely have to have both involved at the same time in this process. So as I say, that's one of the programs we're running right now and it's it's working really well and it's it's been eye-opening i think for everyone looking at everything from a different perspective to what they normally would would sort of experience mm. and i think for for me that's one of the really exciting things about materials is people from different backgrounds with different insights uh to to problems from a slightly different aspect each with their own expertise and slightly different focus and and understanding and bring that all together um, to tackle these immensely complicated problems that, as we've said, have got, you know, a huge number of variables, factors, considerations that we need to make in the design of an overall component that goes into a nuclear fusion reactor or a, a plane or whatever whatever the system is that we're we're trying to design for a particular purpose. Well, that, I, I think that's been a fantastic discussion so far. Just before we finish, um, are there any final comments, Dave? Is there anything that that you'd like our listeners to particularly know about the work that you do, or anything else that you particularly like to to say? I will just say, I think, yeah, at the moment it's obviously. An incredibly exciting time uh, in the in the industry in the fusion sector. I'd say anyone considering the nuclear space or, or potentially considering a career in, in nuclear material science, it's now is absolutely the time. Um, I think you know something of a renaissance at the moment. I think it's an incredibly exciting time. A huge amount of challenges for material scientists to address in the coming years, um, but really critical challenges because you know obviously whilst the work we're doing. At UKA and and obviously a broader across um, the sort of renewable and sustainable energy generation sector is not only interesting from a material science and engineering perspective, it's also incredibly crucial given you know what we're seeing in the media at the moment around climate change, you know, and and these very dramatic 
changes in climate over the last few years even so it really sort of presses that message home in terms of we really need to come up with some solutions to this problem and we don't have the luxury of another sort of century or half a century to sort of worry about that and figure things out we need to get solutions in place in the next next decade or two so that really you know i think gives us a really good motivation it's um yeah it's really nice and fulfilling to have that challenge and know that you're you know contributing to something at that level and i think yeah it's obviously it's fantastic if we can inspire a few listeners who potentially are considering um, careers in, in that space to, to potentially come and chat to us or you know even drop an application and is it yeah it would be fantastic to obviously have the next generation of engineers ready to to pick up some of these challenges I think that's a very, very well put. And there are so many challenges across a broad range of problems, not just in the, as you say, the environmental and energy sector, but a, a number of different engineering areas at the moment that require that materials understanding, which people have uh, have suddenly realized over the last 10, 20 years that that's really where we need to, to push things. Because as you mentioned earlier, sometimes even even small incremental changes can have huge effects when you're working on those small margins, raise, being able to raise the temperature by 10, 15, 20 degrees can, can have a huge overall effect um, on, on what you want to do. And that all comes down to you know the ability to have those materials. So yeah, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Ian, do you have any, any further thoughts? I, I mean, you know, just to echo really what what david said there i mean it's so uh, you know materials are so energy intensive in the way mm. that we make them uh, but they're so useful in the in the things that we can use them for i think we need to actually sort of look at the world around us and kind of value it a little mm. differently to the way we do it at the moment as i say we sort of take for granted we do. that we have materials uh, absolutely we you know, so, and, and we take for granted that we can do things like just recycle our way out of problems so in fact, actually that's not necessarily going to be the case so understanding that we've got a limited resource it's finite it uses a lot of energy to make it should we value materials a little bit more as a society and can we look at it a little differently and make sure that we make better use of it and i think all of that comes together in the way that we're encouraging, I think, our, our new material scientists and engineers to think about the world is to, is to consider the resources that are being used in a different way. And again, like I say, just value those in a different way to the way that we've done it in the past. And, and not using magic fairy dust to fix things, you know, not finding the rarest elements in the world and making a better material from it, but using the stuff that's more commonly available and uh, that that is a big change. That's a huge change in mindset, and it's a very exciting one, really. And I, I, what I like about interacting with our students coming in is that that's now on their agenda very firmly, and a lot of them are motivated to come and do materials science and engineering because of that. Make so that, that's how a, it unlocks yeah. that potential. So, but it's it's a really you know it's a really different mm. viewpoint to the one that was there when I did my degree in the 14th century. So it's, it's quite, quite interesting. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. And Francis, any, any final thoughts from you? I think I'd just like to echo what both of you have said. I think material science itself is becoming more and more of the central focus. Even in the undergrad courses where I teach more and more the students are thinking about the sustainability, about the long-term impacts of what they're using, how they're using it. And so I think that's really like the critical next step in material science. And we'll talk about this more in a in a future episode where we we'll, we'll talk about the sort of the big picture and the, the grand challenges and things associated with, for example, recycling and sustainability. But thank you all for for joining us on this episode. So let me thank uh, Dave Bowden for joining us remotely from UKA. Thank you, Dave. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. And thank you, Ian, for for joining us in the in the room as well. Thank you. No problem at all. And Francis, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And finally, to you, our listeners, thank you very much for tuning in. And please do join us next time when our topic will be materials prediction. Thanks very much for listening. If you want to join the conversation, you can find us on Instagram at Materials Unlocked. If you want to find out more about the topics that we've covered and the work that we do, a link can be found to our website in the show notes. Our thanks to the Advanced Metallic Systems CDT, the Henry Royce Institute, and the Department of Material Science at the University of Sheffield. See you next time.